Well, good afternoon again. Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Van. I am a senior environmental planner here at MAPC. Uh, I, am, I am delighted to support my colleagues with today's webinar. Um, before we get started, I want to share and remind you that this webinar is being recorded. So feel free to please stay on mute um, and feel free to um, uh, turn off the video if you like. Um, today, we are celebrating the much anticipated release of um, the water, water everywhere, the increasing threat of stormwater flooding in Greater Boston report, which you will all receive a copy um, after this webinar. Um, first, I would like to just send many congratulations to the primary authors, uh, Ann Herbs, Rachel Bowers, and my former colleague, Caitlin Spence. I know they've been very hard at work for many months researching, analyzing data, and putting together this very informative, valuable report, which will leave us with um, a lot of food for thoughts and guidance for implementation next step. Um, we are very exciting. Uh, we have a very exciting program today as you'll get a sneak peek from the report authors on some key findings and takeaways. Um, we'll also have a panel discussion with state and local leaders, these are champions in the work um, that we've been working with and looking forward to working with in the new future as well. Um, and so before we begin, I would like to turn the spotlight to Mark Drayson, um, MAPC Executive Director for a welcome remark. Mark. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, thank you, Van. Uh, this is a very exciting time for us. We have been working on the stormwater issue and particularly on inland flooding uh, issues related to it uh, for many years now at MAPC. Uh, Anne and Caitlin, who I think is with us today, and even before Caitlin, Eliza Wallace, uh, were very active in efforts to address this issue. We, we live in a world where due to climate change, we are seeing more and more water retained in the atmosphere, stronger and more frequent storms. I say this after about a week of rain here. Uh, and uh, much less predictability about when truly serious fall, storms and flooding will occur. And we know that our region is not fully prepared for it. We don't even have the best, clearest understanding of where flooding is likely to occur. Uh, there is a lot of attention, as it justifiably should be, to climate change and seawater rise and its impact on the coast. But we also have to pay attention to inland areas. Uh, to flooding from rivers and streams, to flooding that may particularly affect previously filled land, to flooding in inadequately protected environmental justice communities, uh, and to flooding of new development where perhaps adequate attention is not being paid to the possibility of stormwater now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, certainly within the lifetime of those buildings. All of these issues are critical issues. They all demand a clear, data-driven, science-based understanding of what is going on in the hydrology and how that should affect public policy. And I like to think that's the sweet part of MAPC's work in many areas, not only in this area, that we look at the science, we look at the data, we try and figure out what it means and where it's going, and then we take the additional step of making public policy recommendations that kind of try, try and address what's happening now and what's likely to happen in the future. Uh, I am tremendously excited by this report, uh, and I am particularly eager for what are going to be our follow-up discussions about public policy implementation. Where do we need to put the dollars? How do individual communities need to address the issue locally? What are the state and federal programs that exist that we should take advantage of, or that maybe need to exist in the future to help us truly address the stormwater issues that we see coming up over the course of the next 10 or 20 years? Uh, I really do want to thank all the members of my staff that have worked so hard on this effort. I mentioned some of the past folks, uh, Van and Rachel and Sarah, uh, and also members of our communications team, several Amandas, Amanda Linehan and Amanda Bellis, Tim Vile and Ellen Morgan, all of whom worked on this report, uh, and many other people whose names I will probably forget, but uh, who I know really were a, you know, put together a team effort to do the work, write the report, and then prepare for the presentation to you today. I also want to thank our colleagues and friends at the Barr Foundation for funding this work. Uh, they have been a longtime critical partner of ours on a lot of environmental issues, particularly related to climate change and other issues as well. 
and we couldn't have done it without them. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Van. I'm looking forward to this presentation, to hearing the panelists, and to moving forward after today's, today's event. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. So with that, let's go to the report. I'll turn over to my MAPC colleagues, Ann Harps, former principal environmental planner, and Rachel Bowers, regional planning data analyst. Ann and Rachel. Uh, I think I'm good to go. <laughs> Yes, yes. In March 2010, our region experienced a series of rainstorms that flooded roads, overtop dams, washed out MBTA train tracks, and inundated homes and businesses. In Newton, 25 municipal buildings were flooded, downtown Peabody was under as much as seven feet of water, and the Norwood Airport was closed as a result of flooding. To support our climate and hazard mitigation planning, MAPC sought access to the resulting FEMA disaster and flood, insur flood insurance claims data. But data access is strictly limited under the Federal Privacy Act. We would not have been able to pursue this research without the intervention of Joy Dupero at DCR and Thad Legumars at MEMA, who helped us develop a data use agreement with FEMA. MAPC is grateful to Joy and Thad and also to Mary Beth Groff at MEMA, who's worked with us to maintain the agreement. Our analysis of the claims provides insight into the location and causes of flooding the limits of FEMA maps in predicting flood risk, and the likelihood of increasing impacts as the climate warms. So this slide shows the rainfall record from the Blue Hill Observatory in Milton. Three rain events totaled nearly 18 inches in 17 days. At the time, that was the largest monthly rainfall ever recorded at the Blue Hills. As a result of all the flooding, President Obama issued a federal disaster declaration. The declaration made it possible for individuals who did not have flood insurance to file disaster claims for flood damage. So this map shows the location of disaster claims in pink and flood insurance claims in red. There were 20 times more disaster than insurance claims. Because the disaster declaration made assistance available to residents who did not have flood insurance, the database provides a much richer picture of flooding than we would otherwise have, both because of the greater number of claims and also because the claims came from owners who were not required to and did not choose to purchase flood insurance. So this slide looks at total and average claims for our region. Over 40 million in claims were awarded to residents through the combined flood insurance and disaster assistance. Flood insurance payments averaged over $10,000, while disaster payouts averaged $1,500. I think while it's possible the difference reflects great, greater flood damage uh, to properties with flood insurance, I actually think much of the disparity probably reflects differences in coverage. Really, neither flood insurance nor disaster claims cover all of the costs of recovering from flooding, but disaster assistance is quite a bit more limited. Disaster payments were capped at $30,000, while the largest flood insurance payment was a half a million dollars. And disaster assistance tends to be limited to repairs uh, needed simply to make a building habitable again. Uh, so the map on the left shows the number of claims per property in each census block group, where the darker greens and blues had the most flood claims and the greatest concentration of claims. The map on the right shows the distribution of rainfall across our region. Again, darker greens and blues had more rainfall. So you can see the, the claims rates basically match the rainfall intensity. We also looked at flood claims by municipality. The map shows the percentage of residential buildings with claims, uh, darker green showing the municipalities with the greatest number of claims relative to the number of buildings. And again, that's generally matching the rainfall patterns. As shown on the list, in the communities most impacted, claims were filed for upwards of 6% of homes. I actually think that's a fairly remarkable number, especially if you consider that this only counts residents who pursued the process of filing a claim. I also wanna highlight the relevance of this particular storm to climate projections. Larger storms have increased in frequency and intensity and are projected to continue to do so. The March 2010 storms fit the profile of the type of storm predicted to happen more frequently as the climate warms. And by that, I mean more precipitation in the winter, falling as rain rather than snow, falling on frozen ground, or in the case of this storm, on ground saturated with snow melt, and while vegetation is still dormant. 
So central to our analysis uh, is the relationship of the claims to our FEMA flood maps. Um, so I'm going to provide just a little bit of background about the maps. So FEMA develops flood insurance rate maps that project current flood risk. Communities must adopt the FEMA maps in order to make property owners eligible to purchase flood insurance and to make communities eligible for disaster relief. So this map shows special flood hazard areas in blue. These are the areas where FEMA predicts there's a 1% 1 1 chance of flooding in any given year. Those are often referred to as the 100-year flood zones. The flood protection regulations in the state building code apply only in the 100-year flood zones. And only in these zones are residents required to purchase flood insurance. The orange represents locations where FEMA projects a 0.2% chance, annual chance of flooding, also known as the 500-year flood zones. No state or federal regulations apply there, although some of our communities have adopted regulations in those zones. And then finally, FEMA defines locations without color as areas of minimal flood hazard. In practice, these areas are known, these areas that are outside those 1% and 0.2% flood zones are nearly universally referred to as places that are not in a flood zone. So this slide shows what we learned about the location of the claims. We looked at insurance claims, disaster claims, and the combined claims. So blue represents uh, claims in the 1% flood zone, orange in the 0.2% flood zone, and gray represents claims outside of those zones. Really the biggest takeaway from our analysis uh, is that only 7% of all claims were in the 1% chance flood zone. For disaster claims, it was only 4%. And even for those with flood insurance, only 60% uh, were in that 100 year flood zone. And then fully 91% of claims were in those areas commonly understood to be not in a flood zone. Given that FEMA maps are the primary source of flood risk information for communities and for individuals, it's Perhaps not surprising, we found that most officials and residents were unprepared for the widespread flooding that occurred. This also means that almost all of the flooding occurred in areas not covered by flood protection regulations. So one reason I think that very few claims were located in the 1% chance zone, and, and perhaps the, the good news in this report is that relatively few structures are actually located there. Across our region, that figures only 2%. But other reasons have more to do with the FEMA maps themselves. FEMA maps flooding associated with waterways and to some degree wetlands, uh, but they don't capture all waterways because they don't customarily map drainage areas of less than one square mile. And I think we all know stormwater uh, flooding has many other causes, and that includes impervious surfaces, inadequate or failing stormwater infrastructure, but also a variety of topographic and soils conditions and high groundwater. So since we found that flood zones weren't capturing this flooding, we really next look to identify what factors could explain all the flood claims. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel to talk about our analysis. Thanks, Anne. So a major part of our analysis of claims data looked at those flood claim locations in relation to potential flooding indicators. We were interested in whether certain characteristics of buildings and land parcels would make it more or less likely for there to be a flood claim at that, loca at that location. Those indicators include presence within FEMA flood zones, proximity to water bodies, proximity to wetlands, the year a building was built, and the soil type and slope the structure was built on. In this chart for each indicator, the blue represents the percent of buildings with flood claims that are characterized by that indicator. For instance, looking at uh, build year, we can see that 31% of buildings with flood claims were built before 1940. The gray represents the percent of all buildings in the region that have that characteristic. So for that same indicator, we can see that um, about 45, uh, sorry, about 55% of claims were for buildings built um, sorry, I got lost. Um, so as an example for build year again, 55% of flood claims were for buildings built um, in this time period. For each indicator, when the blue line is longer than the gray line, that means that flood claims were overrepresented in that category. So as an example in build year again, 55% of flood claims were for buildings built between 1940 and 1980, but only 30% of all buildings were built during that time. And that's something that piques our curiosity to more deeply investigate. And for that indicator, we will offer some insights a little later in this presentation. 
So our initial objective in conducting this analysis was to develop a region-wide model based on these factors that municipalities could use for climate and hazard planning. And while we do map the claims in our hazard and climate plans, we found that there's no single factor or group of factors that can reliably predict susceptibility to stormwater flooding. However, a number of indicators were overrepresented in the flood claims. Again, meaning the proportion of claims for buildings with that indicator exceeds the proportion of all buildings in the region with that indicator. So these included homes in the 1% and 0.2% chance flood zones, homes built between 1940 and 1980, those sited on high infiltration soils, and those sited on relatively flat elevations. Looking closer at some of those indicators that are overrepresented by claims, we can better understand that while these findings are certainly interesting, they're not super determinative. While we did find that compared to all buildings in the region, claims are roughly twice as likely to occur within flood zones. If we were to prioritize interventions toward households in flood zones, we'd be leaving out more than 90% of the flood claims that were made in March 2010. And then for an indicator like slope, two out of three claims were for structures on flat land. The same can be said for buildings in the region as a whole. Most structures are built on flat land, meaning slope doesn't offer meaningful opportunities for targeted approaches to policy or planning around stormwater flooding. In short, our analysis finds that the causes of flooding are extremely variable and widespread and mostly unrecognized by communities and by residents until a flood is experienced. So as I alluded to earlier, another interesting finding is that the incidence of flooding varied considerably by the age of the structure, with those built between 1940 and 1980 proportionally more likely to have a claim. And we explored some possible explanations of this. We found that buildings built before 1940 were much more likely to be built at greater distances from wetlands and water bodies, which could explain why those buildings are less likely to flood. And then interestingly, buildings built after 1980 are more likely to be built closer to wetlands, water bodies, and flood zones, but are proportionally less likely to have a flood claim. And that could be because landscape and building design in that period is more resilient to stormwater flooding, and perhaps that's with respect to wetlands and flood regulations of that time period. We also explore the relationship between flood claims and equity factors like race, income, language, and places with high concentrations of renters. In the map on the left, we've overlaid 2010 environmental justice populations on top of the flood claim rate by block group that we saw earlier. And we use 2010 EJ communities to align with the date of the storms. Our analysis didn't find a relationship here. For example, flood claims were not any more likely to be found in low income areas. And there's several possible explanations for this. For one, the affected geography is so widespread, stormwater flooding doesn't really overly impact any particular population at all. It's also possible that low-income households may have been less likely to file disaster claims. So despite not finding a conclusive correlation, we know that recovery for low-income households is likely to be more difficult, and we recognize that more research is needed to explore flooding risk for EJ populations. We also started to look at relationships between former or filled wetlands and flooding. This slide shows Mattapan, a neighborhood in Boston. On the left, you can see an 1893 map that shows a stream and wetlands in an undeveloped area. On the right, you can see that this area has since been developed and that there were extensive flood claims in the area. There's no river actually visible there today. We just traced that in to show the correlation with the claims. And we had been finding these connections in other communities as we worked on local hazard mitigation plans. So to more deeply investigate that relationship with historic wetlands and stormwater flooding, this semester we've been working with the Leventhal Map Center and a team of Tufts graduate students who have been mapping and investigating wetlands from historic maps in five MAPC communities. So to preview the findings from their work, the lighter color on these maps are historic wetlands generated from historic maps, and the darker colors are present day wetlands. They found that across those five communities, since 1890, there has been a staggering 56% wetland loss as a result of historic draining and filling for development and agriculture, with as high as 72% wetland loss in Randolph. Comparing those findings to 2010 flood claims, they found that claims in those municipalities were 1.5 to two times more likely to be within historic wetlands than the rest of buildings in their study area. Similar to the other flooding indicators we investigated, however, this finding is not determinative enough or applicable to enough residential buildings to have a meaningful widespread policy or planning impact. However, 
Unlike the other flooding indicators we investigated, this is a hidden indicator. People don't know if they're living where wetlands used to be, but where they've since been drained and filled. So overall, this is an area we are very interested in continuing to investigate, and we look forward to sharing more of the findings from this team's fantastic work soon. Um, and I will pass it back to Anne. Thanks. Uh, so we took a deeper dive into the flooding data in Woburn, and while Woburn had a higher rate of claims than most of our communities, this map is fairly typical in that the claims are spread across the city, there are some occasional clusters, and they're largely unconnected to water bodies. As part of the project, we interviewed over 40 residents. And uh, we learned a lot from the interviews. The first is that most people were unaware of their flood risk and therefore unprepared. That meant they tended to suffer the most significant damage in the first storm. And after the first flood, most people took steps to protect their homes. The most common strategies were sump pumps and French drains. Others included sealing the foundation, landscaping, and drywall installation. Most reported that their efforts helped manage flooding, but did not resolve it. We did the interviews in the fall of 2021, and despite the fact that we were very focused on the 2010 storms, over half of our interviewees reported recent flooding. Uh, so rainfall in, in Woburn in 2021, well, nothing like March 2010, was above average for July and August, and there were uh, several rain events of, of three, four, and five inches. And to us, this really highlighted the frequency of flooding happening in storms that don't rise to the level of a declared disaster. So almost all interviewees reported basement seepage, typically related to high groundwater and yard ponding, or in a few cases, street overflow. Only one person reported overland flooding from a stream. And this highlighted to us really the, the ubiquity of groundwater flooding affecting residents. And I think that's an issue that uh, is, has not gotten a lot of attention in our region. Um, most striking in the interviews was the degree of stress and financial burden people reported. And I wanna share just a few quotes to give you a better sense of their experience. Obviously the flooding was not disclosed to us when we purchased. We had a rainstorm in the first two weeks. We got pumps and upgrades immediately. Just wish we knew it happens. Even when we describe it, you don't quite grasp how catastrophic it is until you see the photos. I was a first time home buyer. The left side of the house has sunk a bit because of water saturation. I'm a retired person trying to hang on. I can't undertake the cost of too many more improvements. It's raining now and my heart is racing. I have to leave work and run home and drop a utility pump. It has just about broken me financially and emotionally. I wish I had known before I bought the house that the neighborhood had been previously flooded. All this money I've spent hasn't helped. How much more can I afford to put out? I'm already in the hole 15,000. So uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned that FEMA maps aren't capturing stormwater flooding and that residential flooding is a chronic issue for many residents. From our work on local hazard mitigation plans, we know that this is largely unrecognized and that unlike flooded roadways and public spaces, it's a problem that typically falls outside of anyone's responsibility. And, and really, as always, we know that residents with fewer resources are going to be more impacted. So more research is needed to better understand the intersections with wetlands, with groundwater, and socioeconomic factors. Uh, but there are things we can do now, and our report advocates policy solutions that generally fall into these three categories. So the first uh, has to do with uh, making data available. Uh, federal privacy requirements strictly limit access to disaster and flood insurance claims. Our state allies helped us to identify language in the Privacy Act that allows access for hazard mitigation purposes. Nevertheless, to comply with privacy requirements, we can't share the claims data with local officials or with anyone else, and the claims have to be mapped in a way that assures no individual property is identified. Violations of the Privacy Act are subject to fines of up to $5,000 for each instance. So the privacy requirements privilege the right of current property owners over the needs of communities and individuals to understand and address flooding risk. As part of the next update to the National Flood Insurance Program, Congress should revise the Privacy Act to make data available. FEMA is a critical source of funding for flood mitigation grants, yet without access to the claims, communities are missing both the information they need for flood risk and the data that could support the required benefit cost analysis needed for uh, successful applications. At the state level, Massachusetts is one of only 15 states that has no requirement to disclose flood history when selling property. Massachusetts should adopt a law that requires sellers to reveal flood history. 
In addition, uh, the state of New York just adopted a law that requires landlords to reveal history to flood history to renters, and Massachusetts certainly follow that example. While federal privacy requirements remain a barrier, there's a lot that can be done at the local level to identify and share flood risk information. We learned that fire departments log calls with codes that identify water issues and that they maintain the historic records. Those calls are not subject to privacy protection. Woburn took that data. They also added sump pump locations and resident interviews to their claims database. Communities should really make a practice of mapping the historic calls and recording current flood information and then sharing the results with residents. This slide shows just a clip of Woburn's website that includes the map claims. Uh, the website also explains stormwater flooding and provides property protection and retrofit information. And we, we welcome other uh, communities to take advantage of that information. Uh, so next, it's clear that residents are going to need support to afford retrofits for their properties. Uh, in 2021, Congress adopted the STORM Act that provides funding for states to establish revolving loan funds. The program can support mitigation projects, including providing match for brick, for brick grants and targets funding to underserved communities. MEMA should apply for the STORM Act funding in the next available round. Massachusetts could also look to Maryland for an example of establishing a revolving loan fund for building retrofits that provides forgiveness based on family income. Other states have also established retrofit support programs uh, that particularly target low-income residents. Even at the local level, Washington, D.C. has launched a program for flood retrofits. They're targeting their resources based on equity. Funds are provided on a reimbursement basis, but the district will provide upfront costs for residents based on need. At the local and regional level, <clears throat> MAPC can support municipalities in developing programs that take advantage uh, of the expertise and access of local building inspectors to provide retrofits uh, advice and support. And then I think clearly strengthened development regulations are needed to reduce flooding and flood damage. Um, flood damage, uh, particularly to heating, cooling, and electric systems uh, is expensive, and it also uh, makes it more likely that people will be displaced from the home. Our claims data showed that 71% of claims have depths, had depths of six inches or less. Um, so the state building code should require elevation to at least that height for all new and replacement utilities. We also really wanna see the state move forward soon with updates to wetland stormwater regulations that take into account increasing rainfall rates and the lifespan of projects. At the local level, uh, communities should incorporate low impact development strategies across their zoning codes and regulations. Uh, Reducing impervious surfaces and managing stormwater at the site level are strategies I think we're all familiar with, uh, but it's challenging work uh, to get that language adopted and implemented. Nevertheless, many communities have strengthened their stormwater regulations beyond minimum MS4 requirements to, the, to capture smaller projects, to require greater infiltration, and to apply standards that uh, incorporate those future rainfall rates. And then I think all of our communities struggle with funding needed to improve stormwater management and to update aging infrastructure. But a couple dozen Massachusetts communities have adopted stormwater utilities to provide funding. We encourage the adoption of utilities uh, along with fee structures and programs that provide financial incentives and support for property owners to reduce impervious surfaces and infiltrate their stormwater on site. I'm, I'm very excited that we have Jason with us today because Dedham has really been a leader in adopting uh, strengthened stormwater regulations. So thank you and I uh, look forward to hearing the conversation. Great. Thank you, Anne and Rachel, for such a great presentation. Um, I get a sneak peek of the report, but it's, it's very exciting and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that we can share that out to the um, public as well soon after this. Um, we do get some questions in the audience. Um, if you do have questions, please drop them in the chat. Our team will um, share them with um, our panelists today. But before we get to, to some of the questions, I get to have some questions selfishly. And, um, and I'm wondering during your research and analysis, um, were there any findings that surprised you the most? Hmm. Um, well, certainly the the first one about our, you know the, the fact that the claims aren't in the flood zones was an initial really big surprise. I think the connection to former wetlands has been really interesting and surprising. And beyond that, I think I feel like the Woburn interviews 
really highlighted the degree to which this flooding is is not recognized that it's not it, when we have big storms we were aware of them there was tons of publicity about 2010 but it was really focused on roadways and dams and and big infrastructure that you could see and i think what we're finding is there's just a tremendous amount of house by house in, individual basement flooding that uh is it's it's not on public property it's really it's not recognized and it's and it's nobody's particular responsibility to solve so that was that was a surprise to learn about yeah and um i think sharing sentiments with a few folks in the chat already the quotes that you um share from residents in Woburn, it speaks volume right the, the sentiments there um you, can you share a little bit more in terms of what do you think are some opportunities for us, MAPC as an agency, for municipalities, um, and even for state agencies to be better about engagement, outreach, information sharing, given the limitation or you know the access to the data that we have? How can we help residents be more aware and be prepared for potential flood risk and impacts in the near future? Sure. I, I mean, I think sort of our recommendations try to address the suite of possible ways things need to be addressed from um, one trying to reduce flooding, but one trying to address flooding. I think one thing I'd highlight is the work done in Woburn. Uh, they they put to, they put to, we put together, we're working with them, we put together the website that provides information, but also provided brochures at every permitting office. So in the planning department, the building department, the conservation department, um, to try and capture people when they're about to do work on their homes to, to remind them of issues and best practices. I think that one really uh, underutilized resource is our building or inspectional services departments. Uh, building inspectors are in and out of people's homes all the time. Uh, they're the first point of contact. I'd, I'd love to see us work with communities to develop programs where our building inspectors are providing retrofit advice. When people come in to replace their furnace, they get advice to put it upstairs, don't put it right back in the same place, those kinds of things. I think we could do a lot of really excellent one-on-one -on -one work with folks. Great, thank you, Anne. Uh, Rachel, one question for you. Building on the data analysis work that you've done here, um, you and your team, what additional data set or analysis that you think could be further study or analyzed that would really help local communities have better understanding of their community's risk um, uh, and, and be able to plan for or make better decision around funding, priorities for capital improvements and, and such? Yeah, thank you, Van. That's a really important question. You know, this analysis was looking at one single storm event, but we know that rainfall happens all the time and increasingly so. Um, so just having access to more data about where flooding happens at any point in the year um, would really be vital to communities. And one of our recommendations that begins to answer that question more fully, and that's immediately actionable for municipalities, is to track local flooding occurrences. And that underscores the need for better infrastructure for reporting, gathering, publicizing local data, understanding where are people experiencing flooding on their properties, on their streets more regularly. You know, our analysis highlighted that st stormwater flooding can be this hyper local issue. So creating systems that allow for local data to be collected, distributed and shared can go a long way in communities understanding and responding to flood risk. And one area in particular that Anne mentioned um, where local data already exists, but is underutilized is data from fire departments on their water calls. And then I would also say that in contrast to that local level data, it's worth noting that as a state, we've invested in really robust modeling and data collection um, on coastal flooding scenarios that take sea level rise projections into account. And, you know, while the lack of strong predictors in our analysis suggests that it could be a really steep task, it would be incredibly beneficial to our communities to invest in the development of a stormwater model that better predicts locations uh, where precipitation induced flooding is more likely to occur. Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, that segue into some of the questions in the audience actually. So one, um, is there any data on claims that weren't filed, either flood insurance or disaster assistance? Wondering if there, there are any access issues to pursuing flood recovery resources? I, I'm not sure whether the questioner was asking whether there's other data than the data that we 
flag so, has yeah. privacy restrictions. Sounds like if there are any data on, like, are there, do, how do we know, or do we know of claims that weren't filed, which seems to answer its own question. <laughs> like if you of claims that data. weren't filed. <laughs> I, I guess one thing I would say is that I, I don't, we don't have data on that. I do really assume that many, many more people were flooded than, than filed claims. It's not a simple process to, to file uh, the disaster claims. I mean, there was a lot of support from Pima for doing it, but it's, I, I think it's, even this data set is probably the, sort of the tip of the iceberg. And did you see any relationship between flood claims and percent impervious cover in your data analysis? Yeah, so, you know, we were looking at a parcel by parcel sort of analysis or building level. And at the parcel level, we did not see a relationship between flood claims and percent impervious co cover. But I think what would be interesting is to analyze sort of the surrounding area and imperviousness's impact or like sort of the general area of imperviousness around um, a building and what impact that had. But that was sort of out of the scope of our analysis. I I would say anecdotally, uh, in the interviews in, in Woburn, quite a number of people referenced recent development that they thought had changed water dynamics and increased their flooding. Great. Um, another question we have is, how much of the inland flooding is the result of poor water disposal, drain efforts, or maintenance by towns? I think that's a would be would be hard to judge there sort of in a quantitative way. I, I think generally we know stormwater issues are related to development. There's a there are there's certainly in the storm, you know, where big flooding issues where stormwater infrastructure failed. Uh that's that's always problematic, uh, given that it's generally underground and you don't necessarily know it's gonna fail until it does. Um, yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> And on, on that, um, too, a few folks have mentioned about um, just having better understanding or current limitation to understand the groundwater flooding and, you know, have that data to understand where to build um, or build areas um, on high groundwater tables. Um, one of the question is, what tools do communities that you might know, what tools do communities have to not allow new subdivisions or new development in areas with high groundwater tables. Is there such a thing right now? Um, yeah. I'm not sure I've seen that kind of language. I, I think one of the things I would say is where there's a tension between, you know, our region needs more housing. Um, so that's something we think about. Quite frankly, if, if I would wave a magic wand, I would suggest that people not build their houses with basements. There's a way to avoid groundwater flooding and that's not to have a basement. Uh, yeah, great. All right, um, I think we have what time for one more question. Um, and has there been any discussion about updating the rainfall rates, two year, five year, 10 year storm, et cetera, that stormwater management BMPs and stormwater pipes are designed for? I, I hope, I, I, I know DEP has been working on, on updating those rainfall rates. It's, it's desperately needed. We're still working on rainfall rates from 1960. So uh, I really hope we'll see that soon. And I do hope they will take into account future rainfall rates. I think we should be looking at uh, building what's gonna be, what, what the conditions will be during the life of the project. Thank you, Anne. All right, I think um, given the interest of time, let's invite our guest panelists to join the discussion and continue this conversation, actually. Um, with that, I would like to introduce um, Jason Mamani from town of, uh, uh, sorry, Director of Engineering from the town of Dedham, um, and Maya Mansfield, Director of Climate Adaptation and Resilience at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, do I see Maya there? Maya and Jason, great. Welcome. Um, before we started, I guess I would love to give a little bit of time for Jason um, and then Maya to introduce yourself and share a little bit of a, a brief highlights of your current work um, related to um, you know, this topic. Uh, Jason, would you like to start? Uh, sure, thanks, Van. Uh, again, Jason Momoni, Director of Engineering for the Town of Dedham. 
uh, obviously with director of engineering, I handle a lot of different aspects uh, throughout the town, but to stay focused on uh, stormwater, I act as the town's MS4 coordinator under our EPA MS4 permit. I am also uh, the liaison to the Charles River watershed in their flood, um, flood modeling project that's ongoing. I'm also the, uh, the town of the financial lead and also a li liaison to the Neponset River Watersheds flood model project that's ongoing right now. And also been um, working diligently with the town over the past year and we're prepared to uh, move forward with a stormwater utility fee uh, that's expected to go live July 1st of this year. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Amaya? Hi, good afternoon. Thanks so much for including me on this um, webinar and in this important report. It was so great to hear all of the all the findings and recommendations that you all have. It's really setting um, the, the stage um, in a really important way to advance this topic moving forward. Um, in my role, I am the Director of Climate Adaptation and Resilience at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, um, where I am focused on the implementation of the state hazard mitigation and climate adaptation plan and the development of our 2023 update that will guide our efforts over the coming five years um, and the interagency coordination and collaboration um, to advance that implementation. Um, I also co-lead the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant Program um, along with the MVP team. Um, which is working to you know, provide funding across the state, but also define how we're um, best supporting municipalities in advancing their own planning and implementation work. Great, thank you, Maya. Um, all right, just a reminder to folks, I know you've been doing a great job, but if you have any questions now for Anne, for Rachel, Jason, and Maya, as we continue the discussion, please put them in the chat and our team will start collecting them and go through the questions as well. Um, I have a few questions here. First for Jason. Uh, Jason, the town of Dedham has been working on flood risk reductions um, on extensive scales and levels for many years now. We've been watching and really, um, you know, appreciate your leadership in town there. Um, and not just on the technical side of things, but also residential education and engagement on the issues as well. Um, could you please highlight a couple of the most recent projects um, in addition to what you just shared just now, um, sort of a little bit in, in detail? Um, and what are some of the best practices or you know, anything that um, you would like to highlight <laughs> to share with other municipalities who are maybe thinking of doing the sure. same thing in the pipeline? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, Van. Uh, you know, just recently, the town of Dedham had a public meeting for one of the residential areas in the town of Dedham uh, called the Manor Neighborhood. Uh, this is kind of a low-lying area in the town of Dedham that has seen flooding risks uh, you know, occur over the decades. And primarily due to, it was a situation not similar to what um, and Ann and Rachel were talking about earlier where uh, land was developed in a, you know, close to adjacent to wetland or even in a natural resource area. Uh, during the time when housing was needed and not really fully understanding the impacts that might be associated with building so close to those resource areas that they experience both types of flooding groundwater flooding and overland flooding. Um, so we've been working uh, part of the, the regional effort, at least on the, the Ponset River watershed side, uh, we, we've been taking a closer dive uh, at looking at the Manor neighborhood through our MVP grant from FY22. And we had a a, not really a focus group, but we had people come in and, and look at the data that we collected uh, pertaining to their neighborhood. And it, it, it's important to bring them in, not only because they're, they're affected, um, but they're also very, you know, they have the angst, as, as Ann had mentioned, about, you know, future storms and, and what can be done in right now. And we all know that things can't always be done by the snap of a finger, but as we start to do these models and we start to do this analysis, uh, we're able to then break it out into short and long-term goals. And I think even some of the short-term goals, even though you know they don't seem huge in the grand scheme of things, it's something tangible that people can grab onto. Um, so we like to you know let them know about what some of those short-term goals are and, and listen to them see whether or not it's something that resonates with them. So you want to be able to you know, implement something that is very uh, you know, tangible to them and also at the same time accepted by them uh, because then they feel involved. 
So you don't want to put something in that they'll have a negative connotation to. So it's very important to get them in. And, and it also allows them another opportunity to, you know, give us additional information. Maybe we saw, maybe there was an additional flood event that we weren't aware of. And so it allows us to bolster our, um, our demographics and, our, and locations of flooding in instances and, and get more data, you know, because there's never a bad time to get data. So whenever we can get it, regardless of what phase we're in, it's, it's always appreciated. So it, it's been a great project. We're, we're going to go back to them at the end of May and, and kind of show them some of those short term goals that, you know, we're hoping to advance in the next round if we're successful uh, with another MVP grant um, there. And we just continue to move forward. But, you know, these grants that the state offers are, are great opportunities for local municipalities and, and regional entities to get some much needed work done because we all know, you know, the capital budget and, and a lot of towns and cities are finite. So the, this makes it, it, it makes it important and it makes it achievable. So it's, it's great to be able to do these types of projects. Thank you, Jason. Um, Maya, reflecting on um, what Jason just mentioned about, you know, the program, the state programs, as well as some of the policy and programs funding recommendations that you've just heard from Anna and Rachel in the, the report and in the presentation just now, what are some key initiatives and programs at state level that you and your team are working on to further support municipalities in addressing inland flood risk and vulnerabilities? Yeah, thanks for that question. And, you know, a number of things come to mind. And, you know, that being said, always the need to continue expand and improve and, and grow these programs and, you know, reports and conversations like this really help to flag some of um, the key, um, key areas and, and key areas to do so. Um, but I did want to mention, you know, starting from the, the planning perspective and, and the statewide, um, the statewide planning. Um, we have the Massachusetts Climate Assessment that came out in December, and then we're currently working on the update to the State Hazard Mitigation Climate Adaptation Plan, which provides the action strategy that responds to the climate assessment impact. So within the climate assessment, um, the issue of damage to inland buildings, for example, was the top um, infrastructure sector impact that was identified due to the analysis of the um, the consequence, the magnitude of the impact, the disproportionality of the exposure and the adaptation gap. Um, and so that's, you know, definitely an area of focus and within the, the shim cap, you know, that goes into a, a more detailed assessment of inland flood risks and increased precipitation across the state and looking at actions related to, you know, how to improve the statewide floodplain management framework for agencies and improve coordination and, and improve understanding of um, best practices and opportunities within the building code um, to advance action. Um, on that point on the building code, I wanted to mention that there's an active um, effort study underway, um, a partnership with HED, the Housing and Economic Development Secretariat and EEA um, to promote a more resilient and stronger flood management standards and to identify um, the needs and options within the state building code um, to advance those goals and also within um, local jurisdiction and what are sort of the recommended you know, bylaws, ordinances, policies, or programs at you know, the local level as well. And so that is an effort that um, just got started over the past few months and will be um, growing over the, over the year and, and have a uh, engagement component as well in order to um, develop those, you know, very clear recommendations and, and language that we would need in order to um, move forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, MVP and the role of that program. Um, right now, as you know, many of you are probably aware, the deadline is tomorrow for the, the action grant applications for the next um, two years of projects. Um, and, and here we're you know, really looking to fund projects that are advancing these top um, impact areas across the state in ways that are utilizing climate change and forward looking data and centering community partnerships um, in that work. And there's been great projects funded through MVP over the last few years on this issue related to, you know, stormwater master planning, um, impervious surface mapping and outreach and um, projects, uh, green stormwater infrastructure design and implementation, um, stormwater model development led by in the watershed association. So all of this work has um, created, you know, tremendous foundations for, you know, future 
action and implementation um, that we are very eager to support through, through MVP. Um, MEMA has a sort of similar grant program called the Hazard Mitigation Program um, that is also open and accepting applications and funds stormwater infrastructure projects. And um, they have a, a contractor on board to support municipalities in developing cost benefit analyses and some of the more technical components of the application that can be obstacles to, to submitting those, those applications. So um, if you're not aware of, of that support, please, um, please reach out. Um, another tool that I wanted to just mention was the resiliency design standards tool that was developed over the last couple of years. Um, there was an update that came out last month and the goal of that tool is really to help municipalities and agencies incorporate climate information in the design of their infrastructure projects in a sort of one-stop way. Um, so um, that tool is online at resilientma.mass.gov. Um, anyone can use it and you um, identify your project location and answer some questions. And based on the available climate change, um, climate data, um, you receive a climate exposure score for the project and recommended design standards um, to incorporate. And, and that is looking at increased precipitation projections um, and can help to inform the design of green and gray infrastructure solutions to mitigate flooding and manage stormwater. Um, so those are some efforts that I just wanted to um, call to your attention and, and make sure you're aware of and happy to answer any questions on those. Great, thank you. If you have questions for Maya and Jason or Anne and Rachel, please put them in the chat. Um, Maya, I have one more question for you. Um, it's been so encouraging seeing the administration playing great, placing great emphasis on environmental justice, um, really through the lens of equities, improving community relationships, building um, and increasing involvement of those combating climate on the ground, like CEOs, you know, advocacy groups in discussions and projects. Where do you see uh, some of the priorities of this work in, up, in upcoming years, um, you know, especially through the MVP programs you mentioned or anything else that we should be paying attention to? Thanks. Yeah, very important question. Um, within, so I mean, broadly speaking, you know, in the EA, this is a, a huge focus and going to continue to be an even bigger and um, more central focus of our work. Um, now under the leadership of Undersecretary um, Maria Villan Power. And so we're so excited to have her at EEA and to be expanding and growing her environmental justice team with new coordinators within each agency um, and a new interagency sort of uh, working groups and, and collaborations, um, developing new uh, trainings and mandatory trainings, both within the state and, and for stakeholders to learn about um, engaging in state permitting and, and other processes. Um, new uh, EJ uh, tools, um, a new new viewer tool that's going to be looking at um, data overlays of public health and social determinants of health and other indices um, to better assess um, environmental or energy burden on a certain geographic area um, or community. Um, and then really building out, you know, on our team at, at the climate team, um, a dedicated, you know, environmental justice climate EJ strategy um, to ensure that we are, you know, centering environmental justice in our work moving forward, and and we're doing that, you know, right now through the the reset of the MVP um, program, MVP 2.0, um, and that application is also out um, due on May 19th, I believe, and we really encourage communities to sign. You know, it's a very easy application, um, and there is guaranteed funding to take part and pilot that program um, with us in its first year before it's rolled out to the state. Um, and really the goal of MVP 2.0 is to work with municipalities who have an MVP plan that's several years old and may be looking to um, reset, revisit some of those priorities um, with a new focus on um, community partnerships and environmental justice with um, requirements around a new representative, more representative core team, um, community liaisons that are compensated and uh, full members of the project team from day one, um, new trainings on um, resiliency and environmental justice and guaranteed funding to move um, a seed project from uh, planning to implementation. And so that is an effort that we hope to really reset um, some of the focus of the MVP program moving forward um, and, and center that on climate 
um, equity, environmental justice, and community partnerships. So again, just another plug for um, communities to, to look into that um, application, quick application, and uh, join us in piloting that um, this year. Great. We have a, I think um, you might, I don't know if you might know this, but a question from the audience about the new overlay tool with social determinants of health expected um, health. Um, do you know if data or something like that, or is it going to be expected to be online anytime soon? Yeah, I can I can check in on the timing of that. It is not online yet. It is one of the goals of the, the new EJ team to, to build and develop. So it's under, under development, but I can check on that timeline. Thank you. Um, I have uh, got another question from the audience. Um, I think I'm going to open this up to, to everyone on the panel, actually. Um, just from your perspective and, and uh, ideas, what can residents across the state do to advocate for the protection of not only the natural resources, but also infrastructure improvements? <laughs> I'd love to hear from the researcher um, and then town engineer and also at state agency. Um, Uh, I, I can go, at least in terms of uh, my perspective. It, it's for residents uh, to get involved. Uh, if there's a, a topic of importance to them that needs uh, funding, they need to be out there. They need to talk to those uh, responsible for providing that funding, attending meetings, talking to select board members or counselors, uh, whatever the, the community may have. Uh, if, if you just sit by and, and you wait, Sometimes uh, you know the bus goes by, so it's very important to be involved. And I, I encourage any resident in any town or city to uh, do the best that they can to get involved in their own community and, and help themselves make their own changes uh, for a better future. Great, thank you, Jason. Go ahead, Ann. I think I share Jason's response and encourage folks to get involved. Also. Uh, on local committees and commissions, your planning board, your conservation commission, a lot of decisions are made there about local zoning uh, and regulations that can have a big effect on, on protecting natural resources. Um, so I think that's certainly one that, that I would suggest is, is get involved at that level. Um, Jason, just on that, uh, so you know, I, I agree. I think it's gonna be all hands on deck hearing from the residents and also decision-making. Um, you know, within government as well. Um, from, from in your position, from your perspective, um, could you share with us um, a little bit more what your take on the importance of municipal leadership and regional collaborations to drive this work forward? You know, sort of um, any ideas to share? This is not easy work for sure. Yeah, no, no, it, it's, you know, it's to have a great team around you. So whether it's locally or, or regionally, uh, those others that come in to help you support you know, your nonprofits with your watershed associations and, and the consultants that you hire, uh, the, the team is really uh, the backbone to that. And the more people that you have in a room, you know, just I, I love working regionally because you have a lot of you know smart people in, in one position who can offer up ideas that you may not have otherwise thought of. So it, it's a it's a great think tank where you can really find resolutions and potential solutions to, you know, a, a lot of different things that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily think of. So I, I always lean more towards the, the regional, you get more bang for the buck, if you will. Um, but at, at any level, so long as you're, you're involved and you're trying to find solutions, it's, it's always a good way to go. Thank you. I think, I think I'd like to toot uh, Jason's horn a little more than he did and maybe pick up on the, you know, involvement in commission. So I, I do believe it's the Dedham Conservation Commission that drafted the original, uh, their stormwater regulations. And I just wanted to note that I, I think they're some of the strongest that I've seen in the state, including rather than uh, a, applying the stormwater regulations only to one acre, they are applied to 500 square feet and they require two inches rather than one of infiltration. I haven't seen that anywhere else. Um, so that tells you it can be done. And it was done, and I think Dedham really deserves a lot of credit for being very forward-looking on these issues. Um, is uh, and this question might be for um, either Maya or both Ian and Rachel in your research. Is there a list somewhere that tell us where there are existing stormwater utilities across the Commonwealth currently? Mm -hmm. 
I, not I that had, I know of. Um, and I don't know. I had one know. that I had compiled. Actually, when our website goes live, I think it might be in our Woburn report. So you might you might find a, a list from that period of time from just a couple of years ago. But it's it's a growing list, for example, it won't include Dedham that just adopted. So. Um, and this question is for MAPC folks specifically. Is it likely that the report analysis will affect flood insurance rates? No, it really isn't. Uh, those are uh, at a at a federal level and 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 it this this won't affect that is the short answer. Um this question next question is uh let's start with Maya and maybe others who are familiar can chime in as well. Uh do you do we know of any of the flood data uh which could be Sorry, do we do we know? I'm just gonna read it. Do we know if any of the flood data know any municipalities which could be in the new MBTA TODs areas, um, which are designed to promote multifamily and, aff and affordable? Just wondering if that's some an important initiative will be negatively affected. Does that make sense? So are there the, I guess I think this is referring to the section 3A, the MBTA zoning. Um, do we have Data on, I guess, flood data in um, these area, these area um, that is designed to promote multifamily and affordable housing. Um, or, uh, do we have that information to make kind of that planning decision making so that we're not building um, affordable housing in flood area, um, things like that? My read of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Maya. No, I was just going to say that I, I I don't have that exact answer, Phil. It's a great question, though, and something that I can look into because I know that these are, um, yeah, obviously incredibly important goals that we need to um, understand how they um, relate and, you know, support one another and ensure sort of resilient um, building of, of housing um, and not negatively affect any initiative. So that is something I can look into, Phil. But uh, Rachel, sorry, you were uh, chiming in. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, Rachel, um, questions for you. What should MAPC do next to help address the issues highlighted in the report specific to the data that you presented on? Yeah, I mean, I would just reiterate points from Anne and Jason and Maya, which is supporting municipalities and identifying and taking advantage of state programs that Maya discussed and doing a lot of the work that Dedham is doing, working regionally, working closely with residents, implementing stormwater utilities, low impact development, stormwater regulations, um, supporting communities and providing assistance for retrofits. And then from that data perspective, advocating for data disclosure at the federal level and supporting municipalities in collecting and communicating local data. And then I would really hone in on um, this issue of equity and noting that, you know, while our analysis didn't find that widespread disproportionate impact, um, you know, we can still hone in on communities that do have fewer resources and are at risk of damage or displacement from flooding and better understand how those households can be best supported. Um, and that could be through programs like the Storm Act, where states could provide loan forgiveness, direct support to lower income households for retrofits, or innovative strategies that provide low cost insurance to low income households. Yeah. Um, and one more question for you regarding um, the privacy rules and you know thinking at federal government federal level um do you think there's any willingness to take on the issues of loosening privacy rules to uh that prevent the disclosure of flood claims data now in the future well the the place for it to come up would be in the reauthorization of the national flood insurance program which congress has to do and i don't know perhaps just saying the words congress would give you a hint that it's not going to be an easy ask, <laughs> given the, where they are on, on, on agreeing on anything. So, but I do think that there, I'd like to think there's a real coalition that can form around this. One is just citizens who feel like they ought to be able to know about flood information, but also all, all the municipalities and states that are reliant on FEMA for grant funding that aren't getting the data they need to support their grant applications. So I, I, 
I, I think it's kind of a no brainer, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it's been on the books for a long time. But um, I, I, I don't certainly not in any position to, to, you know, make any projections about its likelihood. You might have a little um, glow, a magic paint ball or something to, to look into it. <laughs> um, thank you. Maya, one, one more question for you. Um, and Rachel sort of mentioned this, and I think you sort of alluding to it too. There's a um, sea level rise and coastal flooding has been, have been getting a lot of attention and resources to address um, anything for inland and stormwater flooding. How can we make sure that our focus, um, our next focus on climate work can really shed light and more resources on these issues? Yeah, that is a great and very important question. Um, a few things that come to mind. Um, one, MassDOT has underway and has for the last couple of years um, uh, a modeling effort called the Climate Adaptation Vulnerability Assessment, or CAVA. It's the acronym um, where they are looking at the exposure of their transportation assets to inland flooding and um, stream bank erosion based on um, future climate projections. And so um, though that effort is sort of underway for the purpose of this MassDOT um, transportation vulnerability assessment, um, it will be developing um, an inland flood modeling tool that could then be built upon and, and used in different ways across the state. So that's definitely one project um, to follow. Um, another thing I wanted to mention that has been brought up is the, the regulatory package through DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, um, that they are hoping to put out for public comment this spring, spring summer. So um, as soon as they're able to, which is looking at how to um, require looking at an increased amount of precipitation for a design, um, how to uh, remove more, require removal of more pollutants from stormwater, and the need to evaluate um, environmentally sensitive site design, which can include nature-based solutions, low impact development before incorporating traditional stormwater measures. Um, and, and so, you know, that's work that's been underway for a long time and they're really eager to um, get that out into public comment and, and move those um, forward with that input. Um, the other initiative that I wanted to mention that I think provides an opportunity for increased focus is um, the launch, forthcoming launch of the Office of Climate Science through EEA. This is an, also an effort that we've really seen the need for um, over the last few years in terms of having um, a team and, and, and increased um, expertise and capacity um, within agencies to identify and fill climate science gaps across the state um, to convene the climate science um, stakeholder um, and academic community and to ensure data accessibility and the actionability of data, ensuring that um, we have clear guidance on, on how to use, utilize it in, in terms of planning and projects. So that is an office that we are working to stand up and, and to hire some, some key staff roles um, and hope to launch you know, in the coming months to, to um, help sort of elevate and ensure support agencies and municipalities in utilizing climate science um, in their work and ensuring that gaps that we do have in information are identified and have a plan to, to fill those gaps. Great. Thanks, Maya. Um, one more question from the audience. Um, so 40B affordable housing programs require that approvals be given, but often proposals are located in areas likely to flood. Um, what is the state doing to take these flooding data into account? How can all of these various state programs be rationalized? Um, yeah, do you want to take a shot at that or share some resources that we could look more into that? <laughs> I'm not sure if it's relevant um, in this conversation. I'd be curious to know what Anne thought, but the point, the um, the use of these flood claims is restricted to hazard mitigation planning. So I don't know that it could be taken into account for um, sort of those types of development decisions. Well, to the, you know, we were able to make them available in sort of a, a you know, non-specific way that could be somewhat useful to, to people to be aware of that. We MAPC is putting them in our hazard mitigation plans. So they're they're available that way. Um it 
it is a chance it's i mean it's obviously a very challenging issue and there and there there are clusters of flooding that you would want to identify but i think one thing i really want to point out is that the flooding was extremely widespread across our region um and and outside of flood zones so in some ways i feel like really we need to think about what kind of housing and development is flood resilient you, yes you don't want to be specifically in harm's way but there's the potential for things to happen you know in some ways almost anywhere so so thinking about how to build appropriately i think is something we, we need to think about great thank you all well i'm not sure if you have any more questions in the chat um now is the time but i also hope that everyone here joining thanks again for joining us and staying with us for over an hour now and i hope you've learned something new just as i have um, in, in this past hour so uh thank you to maya jason and rachel um, for being here today and really sharing your thoughts and perspective and a lot of resources. Um, I would like to ask my one of my colleagues in the communications department to, to repost the link to the stormwater report um, one time or to the information and the resources one more time just so folks can grab it easily. Um, it's clear that we have gotten um, very valuable findings from this research work, and it is indicative that there's much to be done still and with great urgency, if I may add. And so, um, you know, as we aim to advance climate preparedness and resilience while raging. So we would love at MAPC to continue this conversation, both with municipalities, with state agency, um, you know, on, on, uh, in, in the future. Um, and please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or ideas um, about the report and, and around this topic as well. We'd love to hear from you. So with that, have a great afternoon. Um, thank you and looking forward to hear from you soon. Thanks. Bye all.